price you pay to pursue your dreams Grinding every day to get that dream Ain't no holding back until you get your shot One day you gonna open your eyes and be on top That's the price you pay to pursue your dreams Grinding every day to get that dream Ain't no holding back until you get your shot One day you gonna open your eyes and be on top I've been playing this game since I was 10 years of age I wanted to make my mark ever since my pop won the days When I strapped that helmet I'm knocking dudes into a blaze A lockdown corner going all the way through 7th and 8th grade Entering high school, I'm ready to write another page Busting my ass and lifting weights It's a much higher level, but I'm still making plays No time to party or bask in my glory days It's college preparatory classes every single day Living my life with that singular goal It's the fire inside that makes me whole Looking in the mirror, my muscles swore I'm on a mission and I'm never gonna stop When the ball's in the air like Sherman, I'm a hawk And I promise I'll overcome whatever life throws at me Okay, welcome to the Ageless Movement Podcast I'm your co-host Scott Lohman I'm Sang Poignac Alright everyone, how's it going today? I'm doing great That's fantastic Okay, before we get started today, a couple of things. Um, tuning into our channel like you are right now, we really appreciate it. If you have not already liked or subscribed to the video, please do so. It helps us get in the algorithm and build to a wider audience. Okay, this week, you know what we're talking about, saying? I sure do. We are talking about shoulders. And I don't think there's a lot more people than me that can speak on the perils of shoulders. I know some. Yeah, okay, there's some that are baseball players and people that have had a lot of issues over the years with, um, you know, with shoulder injuries and whatnot. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, there were periods in my life where I really battled with uh, shoulder impingements. And what I want to talk about today is if you are a person that has a chronically painful shoulder, there are answers for you. There's things that can be done to bring you relief and get you strength and mobility again. Cool. Yes. So what are the most common problems, you know, with shoulders? I mean, what do people complain about all the time? My shoulder blade hurts. Yes, my shoulder blade hurts. <laughs> that is like the most common. Well, Although I always, you know, what I get is my back hurts. And I'm always like, your back? What part of your back? And then it turns out it's somewhere in between the shoulder blades. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty common. So, yes. And you know what? I get this very common. People always point to the front of their shoulder and say, <laughs> oh, my shoulder's killing me. And you know what I do? <laughs> you know what I do, don't you? And if you've worked the with me in the past as a student or a client, you, you know what I do. That's the same, very similar to the story I just told you. <laughs> yeah, so what I'll end up doing is, for those of you that don't know, what I'll do is I'll reach behind the shoulder to the posterior part of the shoulder uh, on the scapula, which is your shoulder blade. For those of you that are, aren't aware of the anatomy, um, your shoulder blade, as they call it, is the most common use term, is commonly referred to in anatomy as the scapula. So when, when we refer to the scapula in this talk today, we are talking exactly about the shoulder blade and how crucial it is. So what I'll end up doing is I'll put my finger there, right on the edge of the scapula, very close to where the upper arm bone is, the humerus, and I will hear people, ah! that's what I'll get. And they'll always look at me like, what are you doing? Stop, stop. And I'm like, keep breathing, keep breathing. And I'll massage that area for, I don't know, a couple minutes. And then I'll be like, okay, reach overhead now. And everyone to a person is like, that's a little better. Even though they're still mad at me. Because <laughs> I touched them where it hurt. <laughs> So that is what we're going to talk about today. All the things that influence the movement, the stability of the scapula. Okay, so where do we start? <laughs> I have a good idea where to start. Okay. <laughs> so 
for years. Um, I would go for periods of time in my training and starting in my early 20s where my shoulder would begin to hurt and it would just go into full-blown impingement mode and it would take me sometimes anywhere from three months to six months to recover from it. And I remember, I recall actually in 2009, it took me about eight months to get over the shoulder injury. And, you know, I would go for a number of years and not have any shoulder pain. And then all of a sudden I'd get crippled with it. And there were a couple things that I didn't know about. And I remember, I distinctly recall 2014 was the last major shoulder impingement I had. And it was really an untimely injury because saying you were training for your barbell certification was strong first. Yes. And I could tell you what threw my shoulders in the wrong direction was actually doing the, a military press. And for those of you that are not aware of what a military press is, it's when you set the barbell up on the barbell rack and it's usually about shoulder height. You lift it off with your upper body, of course. You keep your back straight, feet firmly planted in the ground and you simply press the barbell overhead. Now, I don't mean you explosively press overhead where you kind of, you know, bend your knees and, and uh, hinge your hips. That's more of an Olympic lift that you see in, what is it, the snatch or the clean and jerk. Um, what I'm talking about is keeping completely static in the spine and literally pressing the bar straight overhead. Now, Sang had to actually do that along with a bench press a deadlift and a squat and there were minimal weights that she had to be able to lift and I remember I could almost remember to a pound what she had to do in terms of lifting I remember you had to do a deadlift where you deadlifted I believe it was 200 pounds 190 190 okay and you had to do a bench press I believe of 90 correct and you had to do an overhead press I believe of 65 pounds it was either 55 or 60 Oh, and you had to do it for five reps, right? It wasn't Correct. just one rep. Mm -hmm. That was so that that would is what would have checked me out of that whole certification was the requirements for you uh, on the military press. So the military press, I've always felt was a tough movement for me because when you grab the barbell, it definitely restricts your the the position of the humerus when you're pressing overhead your upper arm into the shoulder, and uh, I never liked doing that movement. Um, if I ever did do that movement, I preferred it seated. And uh, I, to this day, I use dumbbells to press overhead rather than a barbell. But for people that have really good thoracic mobility, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the term thoracic, it just means your thoracic spine, which is your upper middle back. It's the spine behind, uh, excuse me, in between your shoulder blades. And... Having mobility there is crucial to doing anything overhead. And unfortunately, I'm one of those people that does not have great thoracic mobility. In fact, I would say I have probably for my age average um, thoracic mobility and or I borderline between poor if I don't do anything about it. And I work at it constantly, not only strengthening the postural muscles around there, but doing special type of stretches called Eldoa to help improve not only the mobility in that area, but also the space between the vertebrae there. So I believe myself that doing those overhead shoulder presses is definitely what put me over the edge as far as developing a shoulder impingement. I mean, how did it feel on your shoulders, Say. So I think the reason why that particular movement was in my certification was it is meant to highlight one's mobility while showcasing their strength. Yeah, I could say, yeah, there's a lot to that. Also, I would say <laughs> how functional your ribs are, the position of your ribs plays a role and how good you're going to be in that exercise as well. Yeah, I went back and looked at some of my old videos and I definitely cheated my way through that because I did not press all the way through and have good shoulder mobility I basically cranked on my spine to make that happen and that is what the general population does 
um, and then that's how they get injured. So I noticed that I, for whatever reason, I had some videos. I was trying to find something for somebody, and uh, I went back and looked, and I realized, you know, this is exactly why people get hurt because is they just keep loading the bar and you know chasing a number and not realizing like what is really required for movement to happen properly yeah i can understand that i mean if you simply don't have the movement like <laughs> like me um that's what you're going to do you're going to compensate somewhere else and it's going to lead to injury so i, I don't really want to spend too much time on this specific lift I am just trying to, to get people, trying to draw a picture in everyone's mind of uh, how one injures their shoulder. But for if you, but, you're an athlete, like, you know, a strength athlete. But for the common person, like, I always tell people in class, the reason why we work on overhead mobility is basically trying to, for me, when I travel, there's no way I can get my suit, my 50 pound suitcase in an overhead bin if I cannot move my shoulder properly. So that's always the main goal for me when it comes to working overhead is, am I going to be able to put 50 pounds, which is pretty significant in my, for my size, pretty significant. Can I do that seamlessly without injuring myself? Because it wouldn't take much with 50 pounds to lose control. Um, I, I Plenty of times I've had people I, when I walk down the aisle and I go to put my bag up into the overhead bin and you know a gentleman tries to help me put it in there and they're like oh my god your suitcase is pretty heavy and you just like put it up there and I'm like mm-hmm you know because that's what I train for is is life I train to be able to make sure that I can function independently so when I travel I can basically do that all by myself without asking anybody for help yeah I, I agree with that a hundred percent I think where um, I contrast with the overhead press with the barbell is there's I think other more ergonomical ways to get to that goal again if you're like holding a dumbbell and pressing overhead uh, there's a little more degrees of freedom and especially a kettlebell because just to hold a kettlebell properly you have to have the right amount of wrist stability and you have to place the arm and the bell in the proper place that's what i like about it i feel like those two items really have helped my shoulders more than trying to press a barbell overhead and uh it's one of those situations where i've always injured myself doing that movement that i just don't I see that and I cringe. <laughs> I really do. Um, you know, for me, I'm very happy using dumbbells overhead or kettlebells in certain cases. And, uh, you know, not everybody has great thoracic mobility. And I'm a good example of somebody who doesn't have good thoracic mobility. And you can't tell me every offensive lineman or defensive lineman on your football team has excellent thoracic mobility. If you see some of these guys with their shirts off, you realize, eh. Maybe they don't have perfect mobility. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. But, okay, so then that leads us to what is the importance of thoracic mobility? Because I think it's easy when we talk to people, a lot of people kind of write it off like, well, I don't have it, and that's all there is to it. But yeah. the thing about not having thoracic mobility, that means you will be limited in looking over your shoulder when you're driving as you get older. So this is the one thing we see all the time, especially when we drive that hour every Friday, <laughs> you know, coming out to Tracy. So true. Is that you will all of a sudden see a car wander over into your lane and you're like, your head never moved to check your mirrors. And it doesn't matter what technology is inside of your car. You are ultimately responsible if you do not look over and see a car coming by. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it's important to work on. And I, I certainly recognize, you know, the importance of it. And it definitely relates to our talk about shoulders today, because knowing how to stack your spine properly is utmost importance. And, you know, the progression that you go through your your strengthening routine is very important as well. So let's get back to some of the other factors that, you know, definitely affect, um, you know, shoulder injuries. Um, let's go back to the day 
<laughs> where I struggled for quite a long time. It was the, um, you know, it was really started in November of 2014. Uh, you would just finish your certification with Strong First. Yeah, I was either. I, I mean, honestly, as, as, a, as an older adult, <laughs> like I am now, that was probably the strongest I've been, you know, upper body wise. And it was amazing. I mean, I was really just, I was doing like, I could do a wide grip pull up for like almost 20 reps. I mean, I was really at a good place, you know, good point, but I had some problems. And, you know, uh, training with you for this whole entire certification highlighted those weaknesses. And, you know, like we were discussing, the overhead press set me off in the wrong direction. And I remember it was the weekend uh, we went to the big game, Stanford Cal at Berkeley Memorial Stadium. And that whole weekend, I noticed my shoulders started to progressively ache more every hour on Saturday. And I even, we were even on TV that day because we were in the end zone. And every time they kicked a conversion or something, I, I could see us. We were right there. And I had my number 12, you know, visitor white jersey, the Stormtrooper white jersey on. And I'm looking at myself on TV going, wow, look at that swole cat, right? But <laughs> I was actually going through a bad period there because that's when my major shoulder, my last major shoulder impingement started to really take shape. And from that point on, I toiled around all the way into the summer, and I just wasn't making progress with my shoulder. It would start to feel better, and I'd start to you know, increase my rehab a little more aggressively, and then boom, I'd have a setback. And I remember just being just livid, like I don't understand what's wrong with me. I just can't heal from this, right? And I went to see a PT, and the PT gave me all this Y, T, and I thing. And I'm not gonna say those movements aren't good. They, they can be beneficial. They just weren't the right exercises for me at that time. And, you know, once again, your best friend, Elisa, I'll just say her first name. <laughs> she is really something. She is like on just a whole different level of understanding human movement and physiology. And, and I get it, her father's a doctor. She easily could have been a doctor herself. And she's an athlete, a rock climber and a kettlebell slinger, just like you. And she can do deadlifts and overhead presses and all that stuff with the best of them. And it was just interesting how you had this conversation. I remember you explaining this. You were having lunch with her. And you told Elisa, you said, oh, yeah, Scott's really having problems with his shoulders. And Elisa's like, well, tell me what he's going through. <laughs> and you described every issue that I had. And, of course, shoulder pain, not the least of which pain in the trapezius, pain in the neck, actually. Not to be uh, facetious, but yeah, there was pain in the neck as well. The scalenes, which run, you know, b beneath the ear, all the way to the top of your, um, of the um, sternum. Couldn't think of that word there for a minute. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, and uh, you, you basically set the stage for her as to what all my symptoms were and what I've been doing for rehab, and I just kept hitting a wall. And you, you were as concerned as me, obviously, because, he, and thank God you brought it up to her. And Lisa said, well, you know, I had some shoulder problems too. You know, she does a lot of rock climbing, so you could just imagine how many times she jacked her shoulders up, right? And, and it's not like a simple pull up where you could set the ergonomics perfectly. When you're climbing rocks, it's like, oh, I gotta reach way over here. Oh, I gotta reach in this area and then put this hand there and it puts you in very contorted position sometimes <coughs> and uh, yeah so she experienced you know several uh, I would say minor to moderate um, shoulder impingements the differences between her and myself at the time is she was much better at managing you know um, the, the impingement and how to um, progress from how to recover and progress from it which I was struggling with and before you knew it I remember you telling me this story Elisa had actually uh, was on her phone and she found this article that she said was like basically the gold standard for rehabbing shoulders and it was a, a strength coach out of Indiana named Mike Robertson and he has this and it was in a publication called T Nation I'm assuming that's Testosterone Nation. Correct. Yes. 
and uh, it was he wrote about shoulders, and he did it in the most amazing way. And I remember you sent me the article when you were having lunch, and it ended up on my phone. And the minute I saw something on shoulders, I was like, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, I was like, there's hope for me. I got to read this, right? And Sang sent me a bunch of text messages. You know, literally, I was reading the article as she's sending me text messages about the article and why I should read it. And I'm like, already there, baby. <laughs> Click. And uh, I'll tell you, it was eye-opening. And the reason why this is such a good article, and I'm going to put it in the, in, the, uh, in the description, and you can click on it, and you'll be able to read this article. It's out there in the ether. And uh, what I found so fabulous about this was he really explained what the problem is with shoulder impingements. And, you know, I'm going to make it really simple because Mike Robertson, I felt, made it real simple, even though there was a lot of technical... Um, terms for anatomy and and, um, and basically um, anatomical kinesiology movement. He just basically says you're 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 impinging your shoulders really because you're narrowing the space between the top of your arm bone, which is your your humerus, and what it goes into, which is called the glenoid fossa, which is basically your shoulder capsule. And he's saying when you narrow that space your probability of impinging the supraspinatus tendon, which is one of your um, rotator cuff muscles, excuse me, the supraspinatus itself. And the key to this is to make sure that your scapula, because your scapula, your shoulder blade, controls all of that. If that, sh if that um, scapula can depress, you create space. When you can't keep that scapula depressed, and your shoulders are elevated all the time. And if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, just sit there and imagine or stand there, whatever you're doing right now as you're listening to this. Ask yourself, are my shoulders up too high? Is my shoulder like almost touching my ear, so to speak? And do I have pain in my trap? And if you're not sure what your trap is, it's those muscles right next to your neck that hurt all the time on most people. <laughs> If you're having trouble and if you can't like depress your shoulders, like make your shoulders go downwards, and if you feel nothing but ravage pain in those traps while you depress or while you retract your shoulder blades, which is squeezing your shoulder blades together, you have a condition called scapular depression syndrome. And there's a woman in there that wrote that article many years ago that um, uh, Robertson references there. And he so masterfully incorporates it in his article, which he really gets to the heart of what the shoulder problem is. And that's essentially what it is. Your muscles in your back and even in the front part of your ribs aren't working together properly in a synergy. When one of them is weak or all of them are weak, you're going to have a shoulder blade that will not move around, that will not go through its joint actions. And the joint actions are actually really simple. They either elevate, they depress, they protract, which is when your shoulders round and go forward, and retract when the shoulder blades go back and the back flattens out. And you have to be able to do those movements while depressing the scapula, the or i.e. the shoulder blades. You have to be able to depress them and go through those motions. If you can't do that, or if any of those motions is extremely painful, then that's the problem. Any comment? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think when you say depress your shoulder, that is very um, subjective in the sense that most people have no idea what scapular depression and how much depression there should be well there should be some depression <laughs> well but some people walk around with shoulder elevation all the time and that's right. what i'm really and referring so that's, to that's what i mean if yeah. you're constantly elevated mm -hmm. if you can go down just a tiny bit you're like okay it's depressed but i still feel like there's even more depression that's available if you really understand how it should look um, and that's where I'm not sure everybody would kind of pick up on that one. So. Yeah, well, I, I don't know that um, there's a required amount for everyone. 
I mean, there certainly is, but I can't say this is the required amount and just blanketed for everyone. You know what I mean? In the article, he, he doesn't really focus so much on that. He just explains that your shoulders are elevated too much. And he uses the best example ever in an article. He takes basically a power lifter, who's a very big muscular person, and he takes a trucker, who's essentially seated all the time and not very strong. And of course, one guy's pretty skinny. The trucker wasn't fat or anything. He was actually pretty lean and had a decent amount of muscle on him for a guy that's sitting all the time. <laughs> and then the power lifter. And what I found so fascinating about it was he, he shows how these two people that do completely different things have the same problem. They have lost control of one of their shoulder blades, their scapula. Mm -hmm. And that is why they both have shoulder impingements. So he talks about how some of the mistakes that power lifters make, that bodybuilders make, and anybody that lifts a lot of weights, including football players or just anyone that even, I guess, basketball players too would be in that category. And uh, he talks about how, especially when you're a power lifter and you're a bodybuilder, I mean, what does a power lifter do? For those of you that don't know, I'll make it real simple. You do a deadlift, which is picking weight up off the ground. Of course, you're mostly using your legs. There is some upper body. Alignment's very important because you can really wreck your back if you don't know how to do this exercise properly. Your hip, your hips play a major role in it. And squats, where you put a bar in your back and you squat down and stand up. It's just like when you squat to sit down and get stand up every day, except you go lower. <laughs> And then a bench press, which you lay on your back, you grab the bar off the standards, you lower it down to your chest, and you press and complete the lift, okay? So if you're a power lifter, you're doing something, some derivative of those movements, or what I call supportive work that makes you stronger in all those movements. Uh, if you're a trucker, I mean, you, <laughs> every trucker does things differently, I would imagine, but the point is the trucker is not doing those movements, and that trucker is mostly sedentary, yet they both have the same problem. And I found that fascinating because some of the problems that plague athletes plague regular people. And if you can help an athlete, you can also help a regular person that's suffering from the same thing. So what he does is he shows them, he has a picture of both of them with their shirts off. And you could see both of them, by the way, had the same scapula that wasn't functioning right because both their right scapulas were kind of what they call winged. So they weren't aligned properly. They were protracted a little bit and elevated a little too much and then they were off up to the right is what, what, how, how I would describe it looking at it, right? And uh, he was talking about how that's a functional problem. That is not a structural problem. So a structural problem would be you were born with that scapula in that position. But the reality is neither one of these guys were born with that scapula in that position. It's what they're doing with their training or with their daily life that's affecting it and putting it in that position. So what are the major culprits? And he goes through the list. And this is something I didn't even think about because I was one of those guys that was constantly pushing, pulling, pressing. That's pretty much what I was doing with my workouts, with my upper body. And he talks about how there's only, there's one muscle called the anterior serratus. And if you're not sure where that is, and that's kind of a, most people don't even know that muscle. So if you touch your ribs, and I'll, I'll have this, I'll have a picture illustrating as you're watching this in the video uh, as to where it is and what its function is, but where it's, where it's positioned is right along the rib cage. And some people would confuse it for ribs, but it's actually muscles and it's just below the pec and maybe a little bit lateral of it. And what that muscle does is, what's so important is it plays a role in depressing your, sh your sh uh, shoulder blade, your scapula. It helps depress. That's one of its primary functions. And it's very easy for that muscle to get weak because there's only two ways to strengthen that muscle. And I didn't know this at the time when I was reading the article. Number one is to punch. And when I say punch, you really throw a punch with an extended arm. Now, that's not a realistic thing for most people to do because for one thing, most people don't know how to punch properly. 
And two, you don't want to hit any bag where you can break your wrist, <laughs> especially if you're a larger, more muscular person. And if you're in a real fight, you want to punch with an open palm. You don't want to strike with a fist. You literally break your hand. Okay, so what is the other thing that strengthens the scapula? Push-ups? Yes, push-ups. <laughs> Yeah, so my whenever I ask students to um, do some version of push-up, um, I'm not trying to do it just because <laughs> I have nothing better to do. It, it is to strengthen that muscle to make sure that there is good shoulder health. But then the interesting thing that ends up the next conversation is I cannot load my wrists. And that's the thing about why shoulder health is so important is because it is also linked to grip health and strength along with wrist, being able to load your wrist. It's elbow. I mean, it's the whole entire arm. Yeah, they all, they all contribute to things. But um, like in my particular case, um, I would say my wrists were fine all the all that part of the chain was correct in terms of strength. My problem was though, was that scapula, excuse me, that anterior serratus we're talking about was weak and I wasn't doing push-ups. It hit me like a ton of bricks when I read that. Okay, I don't really punch, not unless I have to. <laughs> and then uh, push-ups, I'm like, oh my goodness, I hadn't done push-ups in years. And then I realized as he described how to perform the push-up properly, I realized that I'd never done them correct in the first place. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. And what I'm talking about is not so much, of course, what Sang said is extremely relevant. You, If you can't bear weight on your hands because your wrists hurt, chances are your muscles are just tight. You can stretch them and do wrist venting and rolling and they'll be fine and strengthen them, you'll be fine. There's no arthritis there. It's not the end of the world. Um, in my case, however, because that serratus was so weak, I was losing my ability to control my scapula. And that was the bane of my existence at that time. Now, I didn't know it because no one had explained it to me until I read that article from Mike Robertson. And I'm telling you, that was like golden platinum information that was given to me. And I quickly realized, my goodness, I got some work to do. This is my problem. And everything he described in that article, he said, it, it, does it hurt to depress your shoulders? Yes. Does it hurt to retract your shoulders? Oh my God, yes. Does it hurt to protract? Not really. <laughs> right? That's so bad because that was basically saying is my shoulders were, were easy, like, I, it, I wasn't able to put my shoulders in the proper position without pain. And that is not a good thing. And that was my state of existence at the time. Now it gave me a lot of hope because I knew I could fix this. So I got rid of all the YTNI and the external rotation and the internal rotation that the PT had been given me. And I followed Mike Robertson's routine. And he said, the number one thing is the push up first. Now, he didn't suggest if you have a shoulder impingement to do a full push-up because obviously if your shoulder's injured, you're just going to make it worse doing that. What he had you do is get into a push-up position. And this goes back to what Sang was talking about. Um, I use something called the perfect push-ups, which is basically handles. And I like them not because I have wrist pain, but because they swivel different directions. And what it does is it creates a lot of isometric strengthening in your arms, in your shoulders, pretty much in your whole body, even your core, because you want to keep that stable. Now, I don't want to talk too much about perfect push-ups. I'm just saying what I used during that time. And I also had days where I used my hands on the floor. That was not an issue. What was an issue was I never had my elbows in the right position on a push-up. So, what you see in the military all the time, you know, the sergeant, the drill sergeant will yell at him, get on the ground and give me 40 push-ups, you know. And you see these guys and they just look sloppy. They're going up and down, their elbows are wide, some of them aren't keeping their core stable, it lo looks like their backs are arching, it's a nightmare. So he described how to properly perform a push-up. 
And he says, you gotta have your elbows in close. And what that means is your triceps, if you have big triceps, they should be touching your lats when you're going down. If your triceps are far away from your body, your elbows are far away from your body, you're creating a lot of glenohumeral stress, which is basically your shoulder. And you gotta get the ergonomics right, which means moving the elbows in. Now, what he mentioned was before you even do a push-up, get into the push-up position, which is basically a plank. And that's another thing we do, huh, Sang? Oh, yes. <laughs> so all of you that have, I don't know, been students with us or clients with us know about the plank. Those of you that are listening may be familiar with it. Now, here's what you may not be familiar with. When you get into the plank, which is on the forearms, the elbows are under the chest, the legs are straight, the toes are engaged, your abs are tight, your glutes are tight, it's a perfectly straight line, and your elbows are right under the chest. Now, why do we do this so much? Well, the advantage of the plank is it conditions you so you can maintain a muscular contraction for a, a set period of time, which I, I choose 30 seconds. I think that's ideal. If you can get into a plank, a strict plank for 30 seconds, it shows a couple things. And number one, you have control of your core, that you know how to align your spine, and uh, that you know how to engage, engage your abs and your glutes. Now the problem is, you'll see some pretty strong people, and I would have been incapable of this at the time, of using my shoulders only for this movement. I'm using my upper body, but my abs aren't really engaged. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about engaging your abs. So the push-up is basically a plank, except instead of your elbows being on, the, on your forearms on the ground, your arms, your elbows are extended and your weight is on your hands and your fingers are splayed apart. So what Mike basically talked about here was, he says, I want you to get into the, it's like he was coaching me. It was really a pretty amazing article. He says, I want you, and he says literally in the article, I want you to get into the push-up position and I want you to protract your shoulder. So what that basically means is you push into the ground and your shoulders round. And then you can feel your scapula working, which is that muscle I'm telling you about. It's right on the ribs there. And it's just, you know, below the chest basically. And that muscle gets stronger from that doing that protraction. Now I found it was difficult to do, but I could do it when I was injured. What really threw me into a loop was, he says, now once you do that, I want you to retract your shoulder blades, keeping your elbows straight. I'm underlining that, keeping your elbows straight. Because the first time I did that, I, I could not keep my elbows straight. What I ended up doing was I bent my elbows and I'm coaching myself as I'm doing this. And I'm like, keep your elbows straight and retracting the shoulder blade in every retraction I did, it was just painful. And once again, my elbows were bending and I, and I had to stop and do a reset because this is what I tell my clients and my students. So I stopped, I did a reset, I got back into it and I tried more and more and I found that after about the eighth or 10th protract retraction of my shoulder blades under load, I started to be able to, to do it, to perform or execute the movement with the elbow straight. Now it took a lot of concentration. That first few days I did this, these exercises, these rehab exercises, it was not an efficient movement, but after about four days, booyah. I was doing it and you know what? I honestly noticed that my shoulder blades hurt less and less <clears throat> every time I performed that movement. As I protracted, it didn't hurt. As I retracted, it hurt less. And I knew I was going somewhere because that was the first time I had experienced any positive benefits from a rehab routine and didn't hit any walls. Now, I wanna talk about the other exercise. Before I move on to that, is there anything you wanna add? Yeah, so whenever I coach the protract retract, there, I notice people have found, I mean, this is just human nature anyway. Um, so if the elbows don't bend, there's another way to look 
and feel like you're doing what we're asking for, which is retraction. And what happens is that people basically will lose control of their spine and just let it drop. And it's as if their um, sternum just kind of relaxes and goes towards the ground versus true retraction of the shoulder blade. Yeah, that's a very good point. So once again, alignment and body positioning and controlling all the other muscles that allow you to do those movements. Essential. So here's the other thing. And this is, a, this is an exercise I'd never heard of in my life. Now, prior to that point, I had always done like basically side raises, lateral raises, they call it. And I had done a lot of different things. I'd done upright rows with, with dumbbells. Not with barbells. I was smart enough to know not to do that. <laughs> and uh, I always felt like there was more I needed to be doing for my shoulders. And Mike Robertson just hit the nail on the head. He talked about something called the face pull. And for those of you that have never heard of the face pull, I'll describe it very simply. You know how you go to the gym and they have the ropes that you can use to clip on to the functional trainer or the pulley system? So... If you've been into a gym, that's a common thing. And what, what do people mostly do with those ropes? Oh, triceps. Yeah, they're great for tricep pushdowns because you, you can grab each side of the rope with your hands. You can go into full elbow extension and you really feel the triceps working. Now, some people do curls with those. Sometimes I'll do curls with them where you bring them all the way down, you know, the pulley all the way down to the floor. You grab them and you do a curl. And what's nice about that is it's a little bit less um, intensive on the forearms. If you're rehabbing, it's a good exercise to do. There's a lot of good purposes for it. But for many people, they think that's the only purpose of the rope. And for us, we know that's just one small purpose of the ropes. I was just going to say, in uh, in 2000, nowadays, people try to hinge with it. Yes, they do all kinds of crazy things with it. And and I I think... uh, I watch people do that and I think, why not just do some kettlebell swings? It'd be a lot more effective than trying to grab the ropes and throwing your hips back and forward. It just looks so bizarre because they put the ropes between their legs and they're facing away from the stack and they basically hinge and uh, you know bring the ropes upwards. And I'm like, just do a kettlebell swing. Right, so basically they're not using their feet because they're basically kind of counterbalancing against that weight on the cable yeah it's pretty so funny. they're it's they're not even <laughs> driving down into the ground which is how you strengthen everything up the posterior chain so now the load has to go find a different way whichever way that is um you know most likely doing that particular move depending on how if your back isn't stable it would be your spine that would take that load yeah no doubt about it so what we do with the ropes, as Michael, Michael Robertson was explaining to me as I'm reading his article, <laughs> is you set it up very high, so the pulley is all the way up, and then what you do is you grab the ropes, but typically when people use um, ropes on a pulling movement, the palms are basically in a um, supine position. Now. What he wants you to do is take more of a prone grip so the palms are actually kind of facing your body and the thumbs are below the ropes. And I'll show you this with the video so it's a lot easier to see. And what you do is you pull and you drive the elbows back so the the ends of the ropes, which are usually the black balls, pull to where your ears are. Now, the first time I ever did that, I didn't quite get that right because I, I, my grip, my hand position was wrong. And he talks about how important the hand position is because if your palms are in the wrong position, you're actually narrowing space in the shoulder itself and that glenoid fossa. So what he's explaining is when you take the right, the proper grip, where again, your palms facing your body, suddenly you could feel your shoulders you, you're the space you know between your humerus and the glenoid fossa opening up 
Things don't feel so tight there. And as you're pulling and retracting the shoulder blades, you feel all these crucial muscles that need to be working that maybe weren't working hard enough. And what am I talking about? Well, one of the muscles that people complain about all the time, I call it your typical massage muscles, is your rhomboids. And your rhomboid, basically have two sets of rhomboids. You have your rhomboid major, your rhomboid minor. And what they basically do is they retract the shoulder blades. They bring the shoulder blade, they squeeze the shoulder blades together. When you do that, you have to have functioning rhomboids. If your rhomboids don't function, you can't retract your shoulder blades. And for some of you, you take that for granted because you have that function. But a lot of people that have injured their shoulders, and not just injured their shoulders, a lot of older adults that have deconditioned lose their ability to retract their shoulder blades. My father's a good example of that. He has very limited retraction in his scapula. So this face pull really helps with that. Now the other thing it does is, I always tended to think of our trapezius muscles as kind of a monolith. They just simply elevate the shoulder blades and that's it. And I kind of felt like it was a muscle that people tended to overdevelop like myself and that when you develop it too much the tendency is to keep the shoulder blades elevated and that works against your shoulder health now what you forget about is the middle trapezius versus the upper trapezius now the upper trapezius are the muscles right along your neck those are the ones people tend to overdevelop those are the ones that tend to be tight and painful for people now, you go lower down the spine, we're going back to the thoracic area, which is the uh, part of the spine that intersects with the scapula, the shoulder blades. And right in the middle of the shoulder blades, you have your middle trapezius. And what does the middle trapezius do? It assists in shoulder blade retraction, scapular retraction. So, by doing the face pull, you strengthen the back part of your body of your shoulders. You strengthen the middle trapezius and the rhomboids. And so many people, when their shoulders are rounded like they are, the scap, excuse me, the scap's not in the right position, but more importantly, those muscles that control the scapula are atrophied and they're overstretched. So they hurt all the time and they don't function well. And when that, when those middle trapezius muscles and those rhomboids can't, contract properly and pull the shoulder blades back or the, or the scapula back, then you have a major problem because you can't stabilize your shoulders. So that's called the face pull. And Sang has performed the face pull with me. We all kind of do it different ways. When I first started doing that exercise in 2015, which is, um, the, what was it? The summer of 2015, when I started this Mike, Mike Robertson routine, I started standing and then saying quickly got me to, you, you quickly got me to do it in a 90-90 posi position, which is basically a kneeling position. And that worked a lot better because I had a lot more downward pull, which is what you need to do. And at my height, <laughs> you know, I'm almost as tall as the highest pulley. So it's, it's not really good for me to do it standing. So I did it from a kneeling position. And she coached me through it, and I'm very happy she did because that's one of my staple exercises. Now, performing those two exercises together, the uh, protract protraction retraction from the push-up position and performing the face pulls, and I, I have to say, when I started the face pulls, I was a little bit nervous because my, shoulders were st my shoulder was still hurting, and this was technically lifting when I wasn't supposed to be lifting, but... Every successive day that I perform these two exercises, my shoulders felt better. And I kid you not, within two weeks, I felt 80% better. It, it was the miracle drug. Well, it wasn't a drug, but it was, if it was a pill, it would be the miracle pill. <laughs> so yeah, Gradually, what ended up happening was I incorporated other things like scaption, which is kind of like a side raise with very light dumbbells. And I just continued this regimen until I saw my PT again, which was about maybe eight weeks later. And when I got in there, I told her, she asked me, how are you feeling? I said, I'm feeling fabulous. And she said to me, well, so those YT and exercises are really working, right? I'm like, nope. 
She's all, no? I'm like, no. I discovered something else called protraction retraction from the push-up position and the face pull. And I said, look at this. You ever heard of shoulder depressions, uh, scapular depression syndrome? And she looked at me like, no, I haven't. Can I read about it? This is the PT asking me this, right? So I, I sent her the article and she quickly breezed through it. But, you know, that night she read the whole article and she texted me a few times. And uh, anyway, during the course of that, uh, that PT session, she was looking at me and she was testing me. And she's like, you know, you look a lot better than last time. I mean, I'm to the point now where I think you're a lot further along than you, than you realize. I said, what do you mean? She's like, show me what you're doing. So I, I showed her how to do the protract retract from the push-up position. And she tells me, okay, I want you to try one more thing. I'm all, what's that? You know what it was? An actual push-up. Oh, God forbid, an actual push-up. And I'll tell you, that was a moment of truth. That was my come to Jesus moment because I wasn't sure I could do it. You know, I'd been in pain for the better part of a year. And, uh, okay, you sure? She's like, yeah, just keep keep doing what you're doing. When you go down, remember, retract the shoulder blades, keep your elbows tucked in. And guess what happened, everyone? You did a push-up. Oh, my goodness. It was such a beautiful push-up. It was an amazing push-up. It was an incredible push-up. I go down, right? And I made it all the way down. Elbows were tucked in. I pushed all the way up to full extension, to protraction. And I'm like, I did it. And then I retracted again, lowered myself down, pushed myself back up, went back to protraction again. And I, when I got up, I just jumped in the air and pumped my fist. And she just laughed at me, the PT. To her, you know, it was a typical thing, right? For me, it was like, I knew I was healthy again. And I'll never forget Michael Robertson. I love that man. And your best friend, Elisa, I love her too. They're both really smart and awesome. <laughs> yeah, they are. And uh, that's my story. And to be honest with you, I have never had a major shoulder impingement since. Now, I had a moderate one when I was rehabbing my knee. And the reason why, there's a lot of reasons there, and I don't want to spend too much time on that. But as you can imagine, I, when you can't really walk, which the position I was in with my patellar reattachment surgery, I couldn't walk. I had a brace on, couldn't bend the knee. So I'd lay down on a bench, and one of my buddies at the gym, Sean, slid a, 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 a bench underneath my leg. And that allowed me to have straight legs or both my legs rather, it, it allowed me to bench press with straight legs. So I was able to bench press. The problem is that's all I was doing. I couldn't do a push up at that time. And I couldn't do a dumbbell press because I certainly couldn't power walk or farmer carry the weights <laughs> with weight in my hands. That was a no, no. So what did end up happening was I was able to, to start doing push-ups even with the brace on I was able to do it but the point is I had done too much bench pressing and I was getting pain around the scapula of course and I wasn't paying enough attention to it because I was completely laser focused on my knee rehab and what in, eventually ended up happening was I just did a little too much loading on the shoulder and I got a moderate shoulder impingement. Well, the good news is I got over it in eight weeks, which I've never gotten over a shoulder impingement that quickly. And then from that point on, my knee progressed to the point of where I could start performing dumbbell presses again. So I was just benching once a week, dumbbell pressing on, on another day and then doing push-ups on another day. And I actually was doing push-ups twice a week and I was able to do it a lot better because I had knee mobility again. So anyway, I'm proud to say I don't have shoulder problems anymore. I mean, I, it's just, I've never thought I would be where I am now. And at 51 years old, I can say my shoulders are healthier now than they ever were in my 20s. Thanks to Elisa and Michael Robertson. <laughs> and you, of course, because you had lunch with Elisa and you help me all the time. And you're very smart yourself and the most awesome Thank of you. all. <laughs> 
So then just to follow up on a few things. Yeah. So when you say do a face pull, are you, how much load are we talking? Because I get the impression some people think I'm going to strengthen this. And there is a very fine line on how much weight you want to use because this is tied to your neck muscles. You are correct. So, and I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't bring it up. <laughs> and that's something I should have brought up. So, why, yeah, how much weight? So, it's not about how much weight you're lifting. It's really about the functional aspect of the movement. Having the proper grip, being able to squeeze your shoulder blades and retract your shoulder blades and drive those elbows back. Now, now you have to have enough weight to where you're challenged. But you, you don't want to have so much weight to where you're kind of, you know, leaning back or using your spine to accelerate the movement so you can lift heavier weight. If you're doing that, that's stupid. You're actually circumventing uh, the purpose of the movement. You want to be able to be completely stable and pull. Now, it doesn't mean you need a ton of weight. Now, it may look like I'm doing a ton of weight when I do it, but I'm really not. It's very easy. I don't do less than 12 or 15 reps and they're very slow repetitions. They're not explosive, you know, repetitions that you just kind of whip through. Do not do that. You want to pull, retract the shoulder blades and drive those elbows back so your the balls of the ropes go past your ears or, or to your ears. What, what, however much, you know, range of motion you have there. So I'm a little bit careful with that because I barely have enough range of motion to get the balls to my ears. Some people may have less, some people may have more. That's fine. So, you're right. The quality of movement is essential, not so much the weight. And then the other thing is, I mean, since our audience, they're mostly older adults, they're training at home. Hopefully, we're even talking about having the correct setup because I find most people don't even have a high anchor to work from. But um, they also want to use whatever they have, which then becomes... Let me use a TheraBand, and I think people forget that TheraBands, if they are not... Um, they have to be set up properly. Yeah. Well, also if they're not well-maintained, yeah. because a lot of people, they just pull on the same band for a whole entire year and never <laughs> yeah. look to see that their tears, yeah. it's about to break, or it's like, oh, it's not bad. But I guarantee you, if you go and do this, and you're pulling towards your face and you already have a minor tear and a band, it could potentially completely tear and hit you in your eye. That is true. So always make sure your TheraBands are well maintained. If it looks like there's minor tears in them or they've lost their elasticity, throw it away before it rips. Um, I remember Senator Harry Reid who had a 15 year long boxing career. Um, was working out and he was, even in the last five years of his time in Congress as a, as a senator, he, uh, he was using a TheraBand and it snapped and it literally came back and hit him in the face. And he said in 15 years of boxing, he'd never been hit that hard. Uh, I, I think he detached his retina from it and he had a yes. black and blue eye and he fell down and hit his head. And I think he even broke his arm. All of this from a broken TheraBand. I know it sounds crazy. It sounds highly, you know, improbable, but it can happen. So take care of your TheraBands. The, th the other thing I recommend, and, um, you know, the problem with the TheraBand is, you know, it, it's two long pieces you're grabbing, and you, you basically hook the TheraBand around something. You know, usually it's a banister for some people. What I prefer is if you put some tennis balls at the end of those TheraBands, you grab the tennis balls in the position that Michael Robertson recommends, and then you pull and drive your elbows back. That's going to simulate, you know, it's basically going to sim simulate a, uh, a face pull with, a, with ropes in a cable system, which is what you want to emulate. Um, I highly recommend, if you go to the gym though, use the ropes, use the cable setup. That's the best way to go. If you don't have that, just try to rig the TheraBands in the way I described. You could take two tennis balls and you know cut a hole in them 
and then pull the uh, the bands through them and then tie a knot at the end and you can kind of rig it that way. Um, my colleague, Barbara McCarthy, is very good at setting up things like that. She's been an adaptive PE instructor, what, 50 years now? <laughs> So she's really knowledgeable. But for most of you, just go to, when you go, when you go to the gym, grab the ropes, get in that 90-90 position when you're on one kneeling position, uh, grab the ropes, drive the elbows back, and pull past the ears. That's essentially what you wanna do to, to execute that movement properly. If you're gonna use the bands though, you're gonna have to kind of set it up in a way to where it's a feasible movement. It's not easy to set up, but uh, I'll see if I have any pictures of that. But if I don't, I can take a picture of it at work and then put it in there later. Anyway, so anything else you want to add, say? Um, so shoulders in general, um, I would say, you know, I always say in class, you're not going to strengthen your shoulder if you can't load it. And that means if you can't get down on the ground or... Um, I mean, we already said it. It's a push-up. That's a loaded. <laughs> it's a loaded shoulder, a loaded wrist. So you know, I would say work on trying to maintain being able to do body weights exercises on the ground is super helpful. And then if you're not there yet, then you can always do it onto a box or onto a bench or a chair or what have you. But you got to load it if you're going to get strong. Yeah, you could even do a wall push-up where you lean against the wall. And if you're not very strong and you're having a hard time with these movements, yeah, you could just do it against the wall. Or you can get on all fours and perform that movement. Now, not to be confused with a cat-cow where you go through every single vertebrae. You're just sticking to the shoulder blades, the scapula, which is the middle back, the thoracic area. So, and you can do that standing, leaning against a wall, or you can do it on all fours. Just remember, if you're gonna do it on all fours, it's not a cat-cow. You're focusing strictly on the scapula and that thoracic area. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna say, yeah. um, I'm, I'm just gonna give you a link, but this comes up a lot, is with older adults, is the whole frozen shoulder issue. And not only that, frozen shoulder, for whatever reason, is prevalent in people who are diabetic. So... Oh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, diabetes has a lot of bad side effects. Right. So no doubt. that's why, you know, maintaining shoulder health is important because it could be signs of other things. Um, and then, so basically, the... Th theory, or at least one of the theories of the um, American um, Diabetes Association is that the glucose mo molecules may attach to the collagen of the lining of the shoulder, making an already stiff area even stiffer. And that's right now, like I have a client that that's what we're dealing with is stiffness and he is obese, therefore could potentially be diabetic too so yeah um you know like you you're chasing this i need to my shoulder doesn't work because i can't do this and this but it's more like i would probably try to dig really deep and figure out what is really going on and not just try to fix these things on your own and then just think oh i'm just gonna fix this by myself you might need a medical professional you might need a pt you might need a coach. Yeah. I don't. I'm, That's just, the best I'm, advice you can give them, saying, and I want to make this really clear. You and I are professionals, mm -hmm. yet we get help all the time. Sure. And it was help that helped me get over the shoulder impingement syndrome. That's it. If I didn't have Elise and you, mm -hmm. I would be toiling around probably the rest of my life with shoulder impingements because no one ever explained to me what the importance is of the scapula and you need to control the muscles that control the scapula. You know, it's, it's much simpler than how a lot of people in the past have described, you know, rehab from, uh, from shoulder impingement syndrome. Oh yeah, YTs and I's, like I used to do it in the chiropractor's office all the time with my people. Um, because there is no setup for a face pull. Yeah. Um, like I said, most people, I can't do a push-up. So then, 
you know, and then I, I often challenge people to try to point their elbows in the correct direction. And when they can't do it, then they won't do it. Therefore, nothing ever gets resolved. Yeah, understandable. All right, so we covered shoulders, didn't we? We've really covered shoulders today. And I told you a very personal story about my shoulder situation, and I really hope it helps you. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section. Um, I'll try to answer any questions that you have. And uh, like Sang says, if you're struggling right now or you've had chronic shoulder pain, see a professional. First thing, see a, sh uh, a massage therapist if you can, because they can locate what muscles are functioning properly and what are not. And then, of course, go see your doctor. And then your doctor, if you have a good doctor, will recommend a PT for you. And if they don't want to give you physical therapy, seek out your own. If you have the um, money to do it, please do it. Invest in yourself. No one's going to invest in you but you. Yeah. All right? Okay, like I said in the beginning of the video, if you liked it, please like the video. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. We're building our channel to a wider audience. All right? Anything else you want to add, Say? Not this week. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot more things to say in the future. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.